Chem 2211. This is separation of a three component mixture using acid base extraction, which is a specific version of liquid liquid extraction. For this experiment, we have three components. We have our basic component, which is ethyl four amino benzoate. We've already weighed out uh, this compound, 500 milligrams. 0.501, we'll put that on our data sheet in just a minute. We have our neutral component, which is diphenylmethanol. Weigh that out, 0.507 grams. And then for our acidic component, we've got three possible unknowns. The unknown that we've chosen is G85, W5, G96. These unknowns are benzoic acid derivatives. We're gonna to have to identify the specific uh, derivative, the identity of our specific derivative once we go through and do our analysis at the end of our experiment. So let me go ahead and take this unknown. We'll bring it over to the balance here. Make sure my balance is teared. I already have my weigh paper folded into a boat and I'm gonna weigh out 500 milligrams. This happens sometimes. Not a problem. We can just take a little bit off the top. screen back on. We'll close it up to make sure we get an accurate read. Point five zero zero grams. I'm going to go ahead and write all this down on my data sheet. Actually it changed to 0.501. I'll write that one down first. So the initial weight of my acidic component 0 0.501 grams. For my basic component, we've got 0 0.501. Here's our initial weight of the basic component. And for my neutral component, 0 0.507. I'm gonna write out my unknown. Here's my code for the unknown. We've got G85 W5 G96, so that's our letter code. That's what we're going to identify after all is said and done at the end of our experiment. We're going to take these three powders, we're going to mix them in a beaker, dissolve them in methylene chloride, and then put them into our separatory funnel. So we weighed out all of our individual components. We've got our unknown. We're going to combine all three of these into our 100 mil beaker. We're then going to dissolve them in 20 mils of methylene chloride before we add them to our separatory funnel. So let's go ahead and do this one at a time. You'll notice that all of these powders are white crystalline powders, so it's very difficult to tell them apart from one another just by visual inspection. But that's part of the challenge of this experiment. Here's our unknown. There we go. We've got our 20 mils of methylene chloride. Now, methylene chloride is a volatile organic solvent. We have our snorkel in place, so we'll make sure that we set this under our snorkel just so that we don't breathe in any fumes. It's flammable, it's carcinogenic. We have to be very careful. I'm gonna swirl this beaker to make sure that all of our powder is dissolved. We've got a few, you can probably see from the top, we've got a few crystals that are being stubborn, so we'll keep swirling. And there we go. So everything is now dissolved into our methylene chloride. We're gonna pour it into our separatory funnel. We're gonna make sure, first things first, 
that our stopcock is in the closed position. Worst thing that can happen to us at this point is that we pour it in and it pours straight through onto the bench top. We want to avoid that at all costs. So I'll go ahead, pour this in the top. Set this aside for now. So we've got our methylene chloride layer placed in our separatory funnel. So let's go ahead and take a look at our flow chart here. We produced a flow chart that shows uh, the different steps of our reaction in a visual manner. So we have all of our components, our basic, our neutral, and our acidic component. This is all dissolved in methylene chloride. That's the, that's the step that we're on right now. Everything is dissolved in methylene chloride and in our separatory funnel. We're going to proceed to our first uh, separation step, which is the addition of two molar HCl. That's going to result in the separation of our benzocaine from our diphenylmethanol and our benzoic acid. Now in this case we're using benzoic acid as a placeholder. That's going to represent all of the possible, all three possible benzoic acid derivatives. So this will be step one of our separation. We'll go ahead and get our two molar HCl and add it to our funnel. So we're going to go ahead and get started with essentially step one of our extraction or our separation process, which is the isolating of our basic component, benzocaine. To do this, just like we saw in the flow chart, we're going to take 10 mils of 2 molar HCl, hydrochloric acid, and we're going to add that in to our SEP funnel. So now we have an organic layer, which is our methylene chloride, and an aqueous layer, which is our acid, our 2 molar HCl. Can we see our la layer separation there? Yeah. All right. We're going to extract this. And to do that, we're going to put our stopper in the top. I'm going to remove this from our ring clamp. And we're going to shake. Now notice that I'm keeping my hand firmly on the stopper so that it doesn't come free while I'm shaking this. I'm going to be venting this. Well, I'm going to be shaking it pointing down and away from the camera. When I vent it, I'm going to vent it out and away and up towards my snorkel, just in case any fumes uh, vent out the end of the uh, separatory funnel. So we'll give this a shake. Shake it for about 10 seconds. Then I'll vent, and you can hear that pressure release. Close the stopcock again. Give it another shake. Vent. And one last shake and vent. Place it back in the ring clamp. I'm going to take my stopper out, set it to the side. And I'm going to let these layers rest for a second as they separate out. We're going to see a nice interface form between our organic layer and our aqueous layer. To determine which layer is which, take a look at your table of reagents. Observe the different densities of your methylene chloride versus your aqueous components, and that will give you a good idea as to what layer is what, or which layer is which. We'll let this rest for a minute or so, so that the layers will separate properly, and then we'll go through the draining process. So we've let our SEP funnel rest for a few minutes. We take a look, we can see our interface right here. It's a little bit difficult to see on camera, but we've got our bottom layer and then our top layer. So we'll go ahead and put this back in the ring clamp. I'm going to take the cap back off, our stopper, and I'm gonna take a 100 mil beaker, Put this in place. I'm going to lower it down just a little bit. Just don't want any splashing when we're uh, draining out our layers. So I'm going to drain out the bottom layer into this beaker. And I'll do so by just ever so gently opening up the stopcock and letting it drain down. The layer separation will become more evident as we drain off this bottom layer. 
I think we can see a little bit more clearly the interface between the two right here. So that's what I'm waiting for as that nears the bottom of the separatory funnel. Got to be very careful. We want to stop it right as we finish draining the bottom layer. Okay, so our bottom layer we're going to set aside. I'm going to use a little bit of tape here. To identify, we never want to lose track of which layer is which. That's our bottom layer. I'm going to use a second 100 mil beaker. And I'm going to drain the top layer. Okay, and there's our top layer. So top layer, I'm also going to label with some tape here. And I'll just say HCL top layer. Okay, that lets us know what our aqueous solution was. We just want to make sure that we're keeping track step by step as to which layer is which. Now the next step is going to be adding this methylene chloride back in. So I've just identified your top and your bottom layer for you, but that based on your uh, uh, densities, you've already done that. So our bottom layer is our methylene chloride, top layer is our aqueous solution, in this case HCl. I'm going to put this methylene chloride back into my SEP funnel and then add another 10 mils of my 2 molar HCl. So for the next step of our extraction, we're going to put our bottom layer, our methylene chloride layer, back into our separatory funnel and make sure it's closed. that beaker right there. We're going to take a another portion, another 10 mils of 2 molar HCl and add this into our separatory funnel. So we're going through the same extraction process twice. So we extracted our methylene chloride layer once with a 10 mil portion of HCl, now separated it off, now we're going to put in a second 10 mil portion. So I'll go ahead and put the stopper in, take it out, and we'll extract, shaking for 10 seconds, venting, so on and so forth. All right. So once again, we'll look for our layer separation. I'm going to pull this up just a little bit. We can see that clear layer separation between our top layer and our bottom layer. And we're going to do the same thing that we did before. We're going to drain the bottom layer off. This is our methylene chloride. I'm going to give this a swirl just to see if there's any additional methylene chloride. And we do actually see a couple of bubbles that floated down. And I'll drain those off. So now we've separated our methylene chloride layer. I'm now going to take my initial 10 mil portion of HCl, and I'm going to add this second portion to it, draining off our top layer. OK. 
Okay. So if we go back to our flow chart to take a look at what we've accomplished so far, we started out with our methylene chloride, all three of our components in methylene chloride. We just added our 2-molar HCl and went through our first extraction. We extracted our benzocaine into the aqueous layer, which is our HCl layer. That is what we have here, our HCl top layer. In our organic layer, which is our bottom layer here, again, we've carefully labeled these to make sure that we don't lose track. We have our diphenylmethanol and our benzoic acid or benzoic acid derivative. So we've hopefully at this point, we've effectively separated out our benzocaine from the other two components. The next step will be to add our six molar sodium hydroxide to precipitate out our benzocaine. So now we're gonna take our HCl top layer. We're gonna add in dropwise roughly five mils of six molar sodium hydroxide. We're in an acidic solution now. We want to neutralize the solution so that our benzocaine will precipitate out of solution. So you go ahead and draw the sodium hydroxide. And I'll be adding it in dropwise and then swirling the flask. So we'll do this in multiple stages. If you can see, as I add this in, you can see some cloudiness forming. I'll finish adding this pipette, and then I'm going to swirl the flask. Now notice that that cloudiness disappears. Okay, so we're going to go back and add another portion. So we're neutralizing that HCl in our aqueous solution. See our cloudiness form once again. Let's give it a swirl to mix everything together. adding this dropwise for safety reasons. We don't want to put a moderately strong base in with moderately strong acid all at once. We want to do this a little bit at a time just to be careful. Right, we're at the last bit of our sodium hydroxide solution. I think we've got a little bit more in our graduated cylinder here. Again, with a swirl, our cloudiness goes away. The beaker is warm, not hot, but it's warm due to the acid-base uh, neutralization reaction that's happening. We're going to place this into an ice bath and let it sit for a couple of minutes to see if our crystals start to form. If they don't, we'll come back and add a little bit more base. So we finished adding our 6 molar sodium hydroxide to our initial HCl top layer in the hopes of neutralizing our HCl and causing our benzocaine to precipitate out of solution. In order to help that process along, we're going to go ahead and place this into an ice bath and let it sit for several minutes to see if we can induce precipitation. We'll come back and check in on it. So we've had our beaker in our ice bath for about five to ten minutes. So far we've seen no crystal precipitation, so we're going to go ahead and add another 5 milliliters of our 6 molar sodium hydroxide. We're going to do this dropwise again, and while we're still in our ice bath. So I'll add in a small portion. I'll swirl the flask. And this time, 
things have gone a little bit differently. Instead of our cloudiness disappearing upon swirling the mixture, now we can actually see white crystals floating on the surface of our aqueous solution. Okay, so we're gonna add a little bit more. of our sodium hydroxide. And this means that we've successfully neutralized the HCl from our original layer, thereby deprotonating the benzocaine and we're starting to get some nice crystal formation. I'll take it out and I'll tilt it to the side so we can see just how much we've gathered there. So we've got nice precipitation occurring. We're gonna let that sit. I don't think we need to add any more of our sodium hydroxide. We'll let this sit for a few more minutes in our ice bath. Then we'll be ready to obtain our product via suction filtration. So we've left our solution in the ice bath for a few minutes. We think we've finalized our crystal uh, production here, or our crystal precipitation. So we're going to go ahead and take this out of the ice bath, dry off the beaker, and then we're going to walk over to our suction filtration setup so that we can isolate our benzocaine. We've got our vacuum hose, our clamp, our filter flask, our Butner funnel, and our neoprene adapter. Last thing that we need to add is our filter paper. Put that in place. I'll use a little bit of deionized water to wet the filter paper down. Then I'm going to turn on our vacuum. We've got a nice seal. I'm going to swirl my flask. And then I'm going to pour it through my Butner funnel to capture our crystals. And that looks pretty nice. We've got bright white crystals captured on the center of the filter paper. We'll let air pull through that for a second. We still have some residual left in our flask, as we can see. So I'm going to use a little bit of our DI water to try and rinse down and capture those crystals. We want to get the best possible recovery that we can here. Swirl this and then pour through as quickly as I can so it doesn't get stuck on the sides. I'll do this one last time. Remembering that our benzocaine is not soluble in water, so we don't have to worry too terribly much about losing crystals while rinsing through with our DI water. Okay, so just for transparency here, we see that we still have a little bit of crystals left in the bottom. That's gonna be part of our experimental error. That's something that you're gonna to wanna to mention in your lab report when you're talking about your percent recovery. So we compare our initial weight of crystals versus what we've obtained uh, via our suction filtration here. Okay, we're gonna let air pull through this for a couple of minutes to get it nice and dry. Then we'll isolate it on a watch glass. We finished pulling air through our suction filtration setup. So I'm gonna go ahead and break our suction here. Turn off our vacuum line, I'm gonna take our Butner funnel off, and we're gonna scrape out our crystals. We've already pre-weighed our watch glass. Crystals are behaving like they're fairly dry, which is great considering that they've been in water. Water is notoriously difficult to get rid of without heat. So we'll see how this looks once we get everything scraped onto the watch glass. I'm 
going to go ahead and chop up these crystals a little bit to get them separated. Take out our filter paper, see if there's anything caught underneath. There's a little bit. Not much, though. Place this to the side. Get off any remaining crystals here. We'll go ahead and take this over to the drying oven. We've got it set to about 75 degrees to make sure we don't inadvertently melt our recovered product here. We're going to go ahead and try and get a last little vestiges of water dried off of it before we weigh it. We'll leave that in our oven for about 10 minutes. To let it dry up. So we've retrieved our benzocaine crystals from the oven. We went ahead and put them on our balance here. We've weighed them out. Watch glass plus product is 47.880, which gives us, we're going to go through here, 47.880 minus 47.455 gives us 425 milligrams of our recovered product. So this is our basic component. So you're going to use that measurement to determine your percent recovery based on what we started with. Now let's move on to isolating our benzoic acid component. We've isolated our benzocaine successfully. We've got our weight. We wrote it down in our, uh, on our data sheet. Now we're going to move on to the next phase, which is taking our methylene chloride, or organic layer, that has our neutral component and our benzoic acid derivative. We're going to pour that back into our SEP funnel and use one molar sodium hydroxide to isolate the two remaining compounds, one from the other. Okay. We've got our bottom layer here. So this is our methylene chloride layer, our neutral plus our acidic component. Make sure our stopcock is closed. Go ahead and pour this back into the separatory funnel. Let's place that there for a moment. Then we have our one molar sodium hydroxide solution. We've measured out 10 milliliters. So the first extraction is going to be with one portion of 10 milliliters. take a look and see our layer separation there. Top layer is our sodium hydroxide, our aqueous layer, and then of course the bottom layer is our methylene chloride. Close this up with our stopper and I'll go through the extraction. Venting up into our snorkel here but away from our face. separate. Take our stopper off. If I were to leave the stopper on or intact and I was to open up the stopcock, a vacuum would form in the upper portion of our set funnel. We wouldn't be able to, uh, to have any liquid flow through. So we make sure we take that off. We'll set that aside. Let's look for our layer separation. It looks like it's separated nicely. You can see an obvious demarcation between the two layers here. Okay, so we'll put that back in. We're going to drain our bottom layer back into the same beaker that we've been using. Okay. 
and I can see a couple of drops of methylene chloride coming down from the top layer. So I'm going to go ahead and swirl this just to make sure that we've got the layers nice and separated. Okay, there we go. And we're going to go ahead and keep draining it off. And there we go. So that's the bottom layer removed. Place this back over here to the side. We've got a clean beaker here that I'm going to use to capture our aqueous layer. This is our sodium hydroxide layer. Okay, get that last drop. We'll set this to the side and I'm going to label this Is my sodium hydroxide aqueous layer. So that's one extraction done. I'm going to pour my bottom layer, my methylene chloride, back into my separatory funnel. So this will be our second extraction with our one molar sodium hydroxide. So we have another 10 mil portion. Pour this into the separatory funnel. And we'll go through the same process again. Layer separation, we've got our hydroxide, aqueous hydroxide solution is our upper layer, methylene chloride is the bottom layer. shake. Event. We're doing this twice because we want to make sure that we've gotten all of our acidic component removed from our methylene chloride layer. That's why we use two portions. We did that on the first extraction to isolate our benzocaine and we're going to do the same thing here. So we'll set it back down into the ring clamp. Make sure that our layers are separated. Looks good. And we'll drain off our bottom layer just as we did before. Swirl just like I did before. And there we go. So that is our bottom methylene chloride layer isolated. Now at this point, if our extraction has worked, we will have removed our acidic component. We should just have our neutral. We've got our 10 mil portion remaining here of our sodium hydroxide aqueous solution, so let's go ahead and drain that down. We'll combine these two layers. So now we've got our two 10 mil portions combined, sodium hydroxide aqueous layer. In this layer, we have now extracted our benzoic acid derivative. We're gonna go ahead and measure out some hydrochloric acid to use to neutralize it so we can precipitate out those crystals. All right, so we're ready to continue on to the next phase. We've isolated our benzoic acid derivative. We're now gonna use six molar HCl to reprotonate it and precipitate it out in our aqueous layer. So we've got our sodium hydroxide aqueous layer set up just like we did before for the previous step. We've got five milliliters of our six molar hydrochloric acid. We're gonna add this dropwise. 
so that we don't heat up our solution too much too quickly. Remember this is uh, strongly basic and we're adding in a stronger acid so we don't want to we want a neutralization we don't want an overly exothermic reaction so just as we saw before we see cloudiness forming in our beaker as we do this dropwise I'm going to swirl the flask a little bit and we see that cloudiness go away I'm going to move the snorkel up just a little bit here and we'll keep adding it in dropwise. The idea here is that we are reprotonating our carboxylic acid. Our neutral carboxylic acid is insoluble in water, the same way that our neutral benzocaine was insoluble in our aqueous solution. So it should precipitate so that we can isolate these crystals. Now we're starting to see that even upon swirling, the cloudiness remains. So we've actually started to form, not form, but we're starting to we're starting to precipitate our crystals. Do the last little bit of our addition here. Swirl the flask again. It is getting a little warm to the touch. Not hot, but warm, so we can definitely feel the exothermic effects of our neutralization, our acid-base neutralization reaction. So we'll take this beaker and our solution, we're gonna place it into an ice water bath that we prepared ahead of time. And we're gonna let it sit for a couple of minutes, just as we did with our benzocaine to see if we can't force the formation of additional crystals. We'll come back in a few minutes and check on it. So we've allowed our flask, our beaker here, to sit in our ice bath for a couple of minutes. We've finished our crystal precipitation. Now we're going to go ahead and collect these crystals, our benzoic acid derivative. So this is our unknown, right? And the unknown that we're using is G85W5G96. This is our acidic component. We're going to bring this over to our suction filtration apparatus and isolate our crystals. We'll wet our filter paper down with a little bit of DI water, just as we did before. Turn on our vacuum. We've got a good seal. I'm going to swirl the flask and pour our solution through. And as we can see, we've got a nice amount of crystals captured in our filter paper. We've still got in our flask, as we can see, just as we did with benzocaine, we've still got some residual crystals here. So I'm going to take a little bit of my DI water. And I'm actually going to use a spatula and I'm going to scrape a little bit of these stubborn crystals that are along the side. I'm going to try and get as much out of this as possible. Swirl that mixture and then pour it through. We're going to pull air through these crystals for about five to ten minutes try and make sure we get as much of the water out as we possibly can, then we'll transfer them to a watch glass and put them into the oven before weighing. So we finished pulling air through our product here. So our unknown acidic component, we've got some fine white crystals as a result of our precipitation here and our suction filtration. So we're going to go ahead and break our seal, turn off our suction, I'm going to scrape these crystals out onto a pre-weighed watch glass. And the 
crystals are fairly loose. They're not clumping together. So I think we've got probably the majority of our water pulled through. We're going to go ahead and set these in our drying oven after we get them isolated just to be sure. Make sure I scrape down everything that's present on our filter paper here. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use some tweezers. Last time I used my gloved fingers, this time I'm going to use my tweezers to manipulate my filter paper here. Get any remaining crystal that's in the Butner funnel. That looks pretty good. Now I'll scratch off anything that remains on my filter paper. Okay, and that looks pretty good. So we'll set that aside. I'm going to chop up these crystals just a little bit just to separate and spread them out. And then we'll go ahead and place them in our drying oven for a few minutes before we weigh them. Okay, we'll let those sit and we'll come back in a few minutes. So we've retrieved our crystals from the drying oven. We gave them a few minutes uh, just to make sure that we drove off any remaining water that might be present. We're going to go ahead and weigh them. We've pre-weighed our watch glass at 28.843 grams. So now we're going to go ahead, tear our balance. And we'll get a weight for both our watch glass and our crystals here. So we have 29.195 grams. And we'll go ahead and do our calculation here. 29.195 minus 28.843 gives us, and we're looking at our acidic component here, 0 0.352 grams recovered. Okay, so you use those values to do your percent recovery calculation. We'll make sure that we keep these separated and labeled, and we'll go ahead and isolate the neutral component. So we've isolated our basic and our acidic component. Now it is time to isolate uh, our neutral crystals. So we're going back to our original methylene chloride layer here. At this point, we should have only our neutral component left. We're going to pour this back into our SEP funnel and we're going to wash it twice, once with DI water and once with brine. Now with an extraction in the previous steps, we were attempting to extract out or shift one of our components from one layer into the other layer. That is the definition of an extraction. With a wash, a wash is a removal of impurities while leaving the product, our neutral component that we have listed here, in the same layer. So we're taking our impurities out of our methylene chloride, we're leaving our neutral component in the methylene chloride. So our first wash is going to be with DI water. We're going to do 10 mils of DI water. We'll go through the same process that we have before. Make sure that we keep our thumb on our stopper. We'll give it a good shake and a vent. One final vent and then we're ready to drain off our bottom layer. Take our stopper off and now we have 
same beaker for our bottom layer. We're going to drain this off. Slow it down as it gets to the interface again. And there we go. So that's our methylene chloride layer, our bottom layer. We'll set that aside. I'm going to collect our DI water into our catch flask here. Remember, this is going to be our waste. Our product is still in our methylene chloride layer. So we're going to drain off our DI water. Set that aside. Now we're going to pour our methylene chloride layer with our product back into the set funnel. Now our second wash is going to be 10 milliliters of brine, which is a saturated sodium chloride solution. stopper back in place. And go through our final wash here. Shake with a vent. stopper off so we don't form a vacuum. We'll let the two layers separate. You can see a lot of bubbles forming at the interface, but they'll settle down in a minute. I'm going to give it a little bit of a swirl to try and encourage that separation. And we'll start draining our bottom layer out into our beaker. So now we have our methylene chloride layer with our neutral component. We've washed it with brine and with deionized water. Now we're ready to dry the solution using sodium sulfate. We'll decant it off and evaporate our methylene chloride to obtain our solid product. I'll also drain off our other layer. This is our brine going into our DI water solution. This will go into the waste, but not until we've isolated our final compound. We always want to make sure that we wait until the end. So we have our methylene chloride layer in our 100 mil beaker. The last step is to dry this solution. We're going to do that using sodium sulfate. We're going to take the tip of a spatula Just about that much. We're going to put that into our beaker and I'm going to swirl it around to see if it sticks essentially. Each time uh, or any time our sodium sulfate comes into contact with water it tends to clump. You saw that it was a fine powder, a granular powder before. Uh, once it starts clumping you know that it's aggregated with water. So we're going to put a little bit more in there just to make absolutely sure that we've soaked up any residual water that might be present. And give it another swirl, making sure that we mix the powder throughout the entire solution. So we do see some clumps. So the sodium sulfate has aggregated quite a bit of water but it's free flowing. It's not attached to the sides of the beaker. So I think we're looking pretty good. 
So we've dried out, we've soaked up all the water that was present in our methylene chloride beaker. Now we're gonna decant this solution, this methylene chloride and our uh, neutral component into a pre-weighed 100 mil beaker. Decanting means that we're going to pour, very carefully, we're going to pour just the liquid. We're gonna leave this, the uh, solid sodium sulfate behind. get any of that solid into our beaker, otherwise it will mix with our isolated component later. Okay, last couple of drops, and we're good to go. We'll set this aside. We're gonna take this methylene chloride layer, we're gonna put it on a gently warming hot plate right underneath the snorkel and evaporate off the methylene chloride so that we can isolate our crystalline product. Now that we've finished drying our methylene chloride layer, we're gonna place it on our hot plate set at 40 degrees Celsius. We have the reduced pressure of our snorkel just above it to help the evaporation of the methylene chloride. Once the methylene chloride has fully evaporated, we'll be left with just our neutral component and we'll collect the crystals. We've finished removing our methylene chloride from our neutral component. And if we take a look at it, you can see the, the nice needle-like crystals that have formed as the methylene chloride was evaporated off. I'm going to take a spatula and just gently scrape just to break the crystals up a little bit. This is a pre-weighed flask. Oh yeah, those look really nice. Very similar to what we saw, identical to what we saw at the beginning of our experiment when we weighed everything out. So there are the crystals for our neutral component. We'll take these over and get them weighed and find out how much we recovered. sure we've teared out our balance. Put our cover on. We've got a weight of 51.275. 51.275 minus 50.792 gives us a weight of 0.483 milligrams recovered. Again, we'll use these numbers to determine our percent recovery. Now let's go ahead and start characterizing all three of our components using IR and NMR. Now that we've isolated all three of our components, we're going to take the unknown acidic component and walk you through characterization using IR and NMR. So in the laboratory here, we have our thermoscientific Nicolette IS-10. This is our IR instrument. We're going to control this IR instrument using Omnic. Omnic is located here on the taskbar at the bottom of your interface. I'll click on that. We'll open it up. So we're using Omnic 9. First thing that we need to do is choose the appropriate stage or accessory that's connected to our IR. So let's look at our choices. We have a Smart ITR Basic or a Diamond. We actually have a Diamond in, uh, in our laboratories here. So we choose Smart ITR Diamond ATR. We'll click OK. I'm going to maximize the window. Let's go through our collection menu and look at our experimental setup. Our number of scans should be set to 8. Looks good. Resolution of 16. We're doing percent transmittance. That's what you're used to seeing in your textbook and in lecture. I'm going to click on the bench tab and we're looking for our laser signal here. This looks good. Appropriate amount of power that will give us a, uh, a nice result. We'll hit OK. Everything else is set up appropriately. 
I'm going to come up here to my first, uh, the first button that I'm going to press up here is the collect background, call back is what it says. We're going to go ahead and make sure, if we come over here to the instrument, we'll make sure that our diamond cell, which you can see here glowing red, that's the laser coming up through the diamond array, is clear and clean. We've already wiped this down, so there's nothing on it. We're taking a background sample of the atmosphere here in the lab so we can subtract that out of our compound in just a minute. I'll go ahead and click OK. And we're starting to run here. So you can see down in the bottom, we've got eight of eight scans. This is a fairly typical uh, background, what we would expect to see. I'm not gonna add that to my window. I don't want that to overlay my compound spectra in just a second. So I'll hit no. Now I'm going to go ahead and hit collect sample. We're going to give this a name. We'll say Kim 2211 separation of a three component mixture. We'll hit OK, and it tells us to get our sample ready. Using a spatula and, of course, our powder, I'm going to put just a small amount, not very much. It's easy to overdo this. A small amount of crystals right on top of our diamond window here. Okay, and that's plenty. I'm going to swing my presser arm out until it clicks. It's directly above that diamond cell. And then I'm going to turn it clockwise until it presses that sample down onto the plate. And you can hear it won't allow me to press it down too hard and actually break or compromise the diamond. We'll come back over here. We've got our sample set up. We'll hit OK and we'll begin collecting our spectrum. Very quickly, we have our eight of eight scans finished. I am gonna add this to window number one so that we can see it. So this is the spectra for our acidic component, our acidic unknown. This is gonna be presented to you on ELC. We're gonna have all of your IRs for all three components. You're going to go through and identify the important peaks indicating what functional groups are present in your components. Once we finish collecting our spectrum, we've got this on the screen. Again, that will be presented to you on ELC. We need to clean up our sample. I go ahead and undo my press arm. I'm going to swing that to the side. And we need to take a chem wipe, dampen it with a little bit of our ethanol here, and carefully wipe the crystals off of the top of our instrument here. Make sure that it's nice and clean, ready for the next group to come. Always remember to clean the bottom of your press arm as well. And we're good to go, ready for the next group. Now that we've obtained our IR spectrum, we're going to move over to our Proton NMR unit. This is a thermoscientific PicoSpin 80 Series 2 desktop NMR spectrometer. Uh, fairly simple setup. We've got an inlet and an outlet, small capillary loop that goes through the center of a permanent neodymium magnet that's housed inside the unit. What we're going to do is we're going to take, or we have already taken some of our powder from our watch glass here. So this is our acidic component. We take our powder, put it into an Eppendorf tube. I'm going to dissolve this in deuterated chloroform. So deuterated chloroform means that the the proton that's present in our chloroform is a deuterium, right, a heavy isotope of our hydrogen, so that we won't see a signal on our NMR uh, spectra that corresponds to our solvent, which is going to make it easier for us to determine our product peaks. So we'll go ahead and take a little bit of this out, drop it into our Eppendorf tube. couple of pipettes full here. And we're good. I'll close this up. Give it a shake. I want to make sure I mix it up. I want all of that solid to be dissolved. We've got to be very careful. We don't want to inject any solid 
into our system. Okay, we've got some bubbles forming here. Let me go ahead and pop open the top of this, see if we can't get those to clear. Okay, so we've got full dissolution down here in the bottom of our Eppendorf tube. Now along with every NMR that we run, I'm going to place this up into the holder, we've got to add a standard, and this is our tetramethyl silane, TMS. You've seen this in your lecture class. This is, we always set our zero to the signal corresponding to TMS, our proton on TMS. So we're going to go ahead and open this up. Take a small micropipette's worth of our TMS. Add that into our Eppendorf tube. Close that up and cap our TMS. Give this another good shake. Okay, and our sample is ready to go. We're not going to inject this just yet. The first thing we need to do is push the deionized water that's always present in our capillary loop out. So I unscrew my inlet Carefully insert the needle. Actually, before I do that, I need to draw in some air. Carefully insert my needle. Close my inlet again. And I'm going to gently push air through to expel that DI water. Unscrew, take the needle out, and I'll set this aside. Pick up a fresh needle and syringe. This is going to be for our sample. Open up my Eppendorf tube, insert the needle down into the bottom, and draw up. That's probably a good amount of our sample. I'll show you the syringe here. Okay, so we've got our sample in our syringe. We've got to get rid of that air bubble. So I'm going to tip this over, take a chem wipe. Squeeze the plunger until that air bubble comes out, and we're ready to go. Go ahead and unscrew my inlet, insert my needle, screw the inlet back down to make a good seal, and I'm looking at this outlet tube here. I want 10 drops of my solution to exit through this outlet, then I'll know that I've filled the capillary loop. That's actually more than 10, but that's fine. I just wanted to make sure that I got it completely filled. I'll go ahead and close that inlet again, and now we're ready to collect our spectrum. Now that we've injected our sample, it's time to run the program. Let's take a look at our screen here. We see our icon uh, indicated as PicoSpin app. So this is a web interface for our PicoSpin instrument. I'll double click on that. That'll bring us to our interface. Right now we're currently set under methods. If we take a look at methods, we're set to auto shim. We need to click on methods and choose one pulse. Our requested number of scans will be eight. And we're ready to go. Down in the bottom, we can follow the progress of our scan. So once we get to the end of eight scans, then we'll be able to see our full spectrum. Pay attention to how rough this starts out in the beginning, and then as we go through multiple iterations of our scan, it starts to resolve into a, a much more easily readable spectrum. All right, so we're 100% complete at this point. So we can see a series of peaks. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. So we can get a sense of what we're looking at. We're going to pass this through a program called Mestre-C where we're going to give integration values 
Uh, we're going to set our TMS peak, which we see right here. That's going to be set to zero, so that will shift all of this in line, and we'll give you the, uh, the familiar delta values that you're used to seeing from your lecture class. Once that's all cleaned up, we'll present that to you on ELC. So on ELC, you'll have IR samples or IR spectra for all of your individual components. You'll have proton NMR spectra for all of your individual components. In your lab report, you'll go through and identify all of the important peaks what they mean uh, in regards to correctly identifying the structure of the individual component. Good luck with your lab write-ups.